So this is a really important topic that I bet you all have in your office. A person comes in, I can't hear, I woke up, something's wrong on the right side. This is a medical emergency. And so we all need to be on the same page for uh, what sudden sensory neural hearing loss uh, presents like and how we should treat it right away. So um, as you all know, hearing loss breaks up into conductive loss and sensory loss. Conductive loss you could pretty much see with your otoscopic exam. There's going to be wax, there's going to be a hole in the eardrum, there's going to be fluid. Um, if you don't see any of those items and you see a normal eardrum, you can assume it's sensory. Um, you can do tuning fork exams, which we'll talk about in order to determine which side. But the presentation, you know, they may not come in saying, I can't hear. They may come in saying, I feel full, pressure, underwater, muffled, clogged, plugged, or can't hear, or roaring loud tinnitus. Any of those things, red alert, could be a profound sensory loss. You look in their ear, looks good, looks normal. That is a big warning sign. Normal exam with any of those um, presenting symptoms should automatically get a hearing test. Tuning fork exam, you know, a lot of my ENT residents can't get this right. It's very confusing. You put the tuning fork on, I usually just put it right on the teeth with a four by four. Just forget the hole on the head. People have thick, thick, soft tissue. If you go right on the teeth, this is the most conductive component of the skull. So I put a four by four to protect for sterility, put it right on the teeth. If, it, if, if the patient hears it on the non-complaining ear, bingo, that's bad. So non I came in from my right ear, but I'm hearing the sound only in my left. Okay, audiogram. If they hear it on the complaining ear, then there's probably fluid that you couldn't quite pick up on the otoscopy exam. Fluid's really hard to see. And so that also needs an audiogram, but probably dealing with some fluid in the middle ear and a conductive loss. Um, this is what the audiogram would look like when they came in. Um, right side is normal, left side profound. The definition is 30 dB or greater loss over three contiguous audiogram frequencies. I'm very liberal on interpreting that. Um, it doesn't have to be an exact definition. Any hearing loss is important to treat. Um, what is the exact incidence? It's, it's not clear because many patients don't present to the doctor. Many patients are presenting to many different kinds of doctor. it's hard, doctors. It's hard to collect this data, but it's thought that around 11 to 77 per 100,000 people per year, any age can be affected, most commonly 40s to 50s, males equal females. 90% is idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss. We think there may be a viral infectious component. The data on that is very limited. Cadaver studies where we looked at cadaver temporal bone specimens, they seem to have a, vi a higher viral load. It's very wishy-washy data. We still need more studies. People can also have autoimmune etiologies, neurologic, metabolic, vascular, ototoxic, trauma, neoplasms. Um, Unilateral is much more common than bilateral, but if they do come in with, I can't hear on both sides, those patients are usually older, usually with significant cardiovascular disease, and uh, positive ANA titers have been um, associated with bilateral loss. Um, looking at the national guidelines for sudden sensory neural hearing loss, serology is not necessary if you have a run-of-the-mill patient. Limited targeted serology is recommended in certain patient populations. So if you're worried about infection, CBC, CMP, if you're worried about inflammation or autoimmune, you can get, you know, you guys are all more familiar with all of these than we are really, you know, you know SED rates, rheumatoid factors, C-reactive proteins, ANA, <coughs> travel history, so Lyme disease, uh, sexual history, syphilis, um, just a side note to me to, to add some 
some interest to the talk. When I was a resident in St. Louis, we uncovered a syphilis ring in, um, in, in the suburbs of St. Louis, a very affluent area. And that was uncomfortable. Um, because my, my teachers would make me go in and, and you know, these were much older men um, and they were uncomfortable talking about sexual history so they would make me as the female, you know, younger resident go in and talk about all this and, they, and then I, we realized that these groups of people were all living in the same area and there was some exchanging going on. So sexual history, syphilis is a big sudden sensory neural hearing loss um, contributor, HSV, HIV, and then don't forget the thyroid. So if you have a hypothyroid, hyperthyroid patient, this can cause sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Don't forget COVID. I'm seeing a huge influx of sudden sensory neural hearing loss post-COVID, post-vaccine, post-booster. It's usually in the weak window. Obviously, there's nothing we can do to prove it. But there is data now from COVID cadaver studies that COVID does live in the inner ear. It does live in the temporal bone. People are presenting with tinnitus, new onset dizziness, and new onset hearing loss. So don't forget COVID. Um, always obtain an MRI. Sudden sensory neural hearing loss, even if they respond to steroids, even if we get their hearing back, must have an MRI. One to 5% of acoustic neuromas will present with a sudden loss. 95, 99% will present with that slow, progressive, unilateral hearing loss, but one to 5% will present with an acute loss. Must get an MRI. I've uncovered multiple cases of multiple sclerosis uh, as sudden hearing loss being their presenting symptoms. And um, although you look for other neurologic factors, you can't forget stroke. Now, obviously, these patients, you know, you think about um, ICA strokes with sudden hearing loss, they will have a laundry list of other neurologic factors, Horner syndrome, diplopia, nystagmus, facial weakness. So just anyone with a sudden loss needs an MRI. I get IAC with and without contrast and no need for CT scan. This was in the guidelines, no CT scan. This is our guideline, clinical practice guideline that was put together by our, our, um, our otolaryngology uh, academy. Steroids, steroids are the key. The earlier the steroids, the better. The day they walk in your office before you even send them, um, after you have evidence of loss, we must give steroids. Oral, if possible, obviously, if they're a diabetic, other contraindications, you can, I'm happy to see them same day for an injection into the ear. The earlier you give steroids, the better they will do. The longer we delay, the worse the hearing outcomes. This is the regimen. This is not a Meddral dose pack. This is high dose. This is high dose. This is 60 milligrams for seven days. Taper it off over the next seven days. I always protect the stomach with Prilosec and um, Benadryl for a sleep disturbance at night. Um, you can even do that before you get the MRI, no harm or foul. So while usually they come into my office, they haven't had an MRI, start them on the oral steroids, get the MRI, come back in, retest the hearing. If people want a full core press, I'm happy to do an IT DEX injection as well at the same time. The traditional gold standard is you try oral first, you get the MRI and you do a salvage with IT injection. I do 24 milligrams per mil. And um, I usually do three weeks and get sequential audiograms to see how we're doing. Plus or minus on the hyperbaric oxygen treatment, it is um, given equivocal uh, recommendations by our guidelines. There is, uh, the, the FDA does not suggest it and therefore we can't get insurance to pay for it, but I've had several patients who have had a great response with the hyperbaric oxygen. The data is limited across the country. In Europe, um, people are doing all sorts of things. They, they uh, admit these patients to the hospital. They're giving them IV vasodilation, IV thrombolytics, IV vasoactive substances. 
really none of it has panned out as far as data. And so uh, this is not standard of practice for us. Also in, the, in our guidelines, antivirals were not um, recommended. However, you know, there's really no harm or foul if you give them, but in our guidelines, they are not recommended and actually strongly recommended against because of the data. When I counsel folks, I tell folks that um, the data shows that people break up into thirds. Uh, one third of folks with steroid intervention have a, a back to normal improvement. One third will have some objective measure of improvement on their audiogram, but not back up to normal. And one third, no matter what we do, orals, injectables, hyperbaric will not have any improvement. The problem is I can't predict which group they'll fall into, and so we treat everyone the same. Um, I do not usually talk about hearing devices in the beginning of our situation because people really are traumatized. I wait until I'm seeing them back more and more and kind of gently start to introduce the interventions of hearing aids and cochlear implants sort of as they're mentally um, preparing if we're not making progress. And Becky and I usually talk behind, you know, in the hall with the patients. It's very traumatic for the patients. So you sort of have to hold their hands through the process. So, you know, take home message, when in doubt, get an audiogram. When in doubt, start steroids early, um, and another, another plug. Um, and um, I, here is my cell phone. I really try to keep up with the email. I, I fail miserably, but I'm pretty good with my cell phone. You can call me or text me anytime. So.